I do, I do need a fan right there. All right. Revelation, where am I going? Revelation chapter number 11. We left off with the two witnesses last week, and now we're going to pick up in the last part of the chapter. Now, you have to understand this is one of those big places where you really have to remember that Revelation is not written chronologically. One of the biggest mistakes of guys like Tim LaHaye and, um, you know, even Larkin to an extent and those guys... One of the biggest mistakes they make is they fail to realize that Revelation is not written chronologically. All right, in case you don't know what that means, I'm sure everybody here knows what chronological means. Let's just say for all the people on YouTube that will listen to this later, amen, uh, that, that chronologically means that it's not written in a straight line. Revelation is not a storybook. Your Bible's not a storybook if you want to get real technical. You have to rightly divide it. God, seemingly, is never concerned about chronological order. Uh, God will oftentimes, for example, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Ezekiel 38 is about the battle of the millennial, at the end of the millennial kingdom, the battle of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 39 is about the battle of Armageddon. You know what the problem is? Those are switched. All right? Battle of Armageddon comes first. But Ezekiel 38 talks about the millennial kingdom first. God is just simply not concerned about chronological order. God oftentimes will change up or switch chronological order with, even within the same verse at times. So you just have to be really careful when you study in your Bible that you pay attention to that. And Revelation here is one of those perfect examples because notice in verse 14, the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Now hold on a second. Notice right here in verse number 15, what's going on? What's happening? The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. When does that happen? In the millennial kingdom. Right? When the kingdoms, plural, of this world become the kingdom, singular, of our God, of, excuse me, of our Lord and of His Christ. So notice Revelation 11 is ending with the millennial kingdom. Well, if you were to take, the, if you were to take Revelation uh, as a chronological view just all the way through, you've got halfway through the tribulation period, then Revelation 11, uh, Jesus Christ beginning to reign on the earth. That's a tangled mess, man. That's why you've got to rightly divide it. So, in verse 15, the millennial kingdom comes into play. The kingdom is of our Lord and of His Christ, and He reigns forever and ever. Verse 16, And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power. Notice this. And what? Has reigned. Hold on a second. Notice how God does this. See, God is so unconcerned about about making things, you know, uh, uh, chronological. And and notice, notice in your Bible. This also is a great uh, uh, time to pause and look at the gap theory. All right. Actually, we should call it the gap fact. Right. God does not pay any attention to fill in the blank sometimes between statements. Notice this. All right, verse number 15. He reigns. The millennial kingdom starts. The thousand years starts. Verse 16, all the elders and all that fall down and worship. Verse 17, what are they saying? Which art to come, uh, excuse me, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and past tense, what? Hast reigned. Past tense. So when does verse 17 take place? The beginning of the millennial kingdom or the end of the millennial kingdom? The end of the millennial kingdom. So verse 17, so from verse 15 to verse 17 is a 1,000 year gap. Do you see that there? Let me show you a famous one. Look at Isaiah chapter 61. Look at Isaiah chapter 61. Very famous gap here. We won't even look at Genesis. We won't even go to Genesis 1-1, Genesis 1-2. That's the most famous of all the gaps. But we won't even look at that one. Look here... At, at Isaiah chapter 61. All right? 
Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. See that there? Now, when is the day of vengeance of our God? Armageddon. Battle of Armageddon. Go to Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke chapter number 4. Alright, Luke chapter number 4, and look there at verse number 18. Now, Jesus Christ is reading Isaiah 61. He goes into the synagogue in Nazareth. And he's reading Isaiah 61. Notice, let's, let's even look at verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of... Vi oh, wait a second. Do you see that there? Jesus Christ literally stopped in the middle of Isaiah 61, verse 2. He stops. Why? Because he's there to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Notice verse 20, and he closed the book. He closed it right in the middle of a verse. You say, why? Because he was not there to proclaim the day of vengeance. Notice, literally, the comma in verse 2 of Isaiah 61, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God, there is a 2,000-year gap right there, at least, right? Because the day of the Lord hadn't happened yet. The Armageddon hadn't happened. So God doesn't pay any attention. I could show you multitudes of places in the Bible where that gap fact, that gap principle is there. So, Revelation, back in Revelation 11, we find one of them here. So, Re uh, Revelation... 1117, we pick up and we're at the end of the millennial kingdom. Now notice verse 18. What happens at the end of the millennial kingdom? Satan comes out, Satan comes out deceives the nations once more, right? And then all of a sudden, God destroys everything. And then what happens? Huh? Great white throne judgment. All right. Well, look at verse number 18. And the nations were what? Angry. What does that sound like? Look at, keep your finger in Revelation 11 and then go to Revelation 20. We're going to flip back and forth for a minute. Keep your finger in Revelation 11, but then go to Revelation chapter 20. All right, Revelation chapter number 20, and look there at verse number 8. And shall go out, saw him out the devil after he's loosed from his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners, right? Verse number 9, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. There's the, na the nations were angry. All right, look at Revelation eleven eighteen, And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. Right? So notice, the time of the dead that they're judged. He gives rewards to the prophets and saints, to those that fear his name, small and great. So remember that wording. Look at Revelation 20. This is the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead... Small and great. Is that, what, is that exactly what we find in Revelation 11? Absolutely. Small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Notice it says in Revelation eleven eighteen, 18, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. See, the, the wording is exactly the same. And they are judged according to their works. And verse 13 uh, they're judged according to their works. That's giving rewards. So notice Revelation, back in Revelation 11, verse 18, 
we find the great white throne judgment. Now, here's what something is very interesting. I personally believe that the Old Testament saints, that they are not judged at the judgment seat of Christ. They're also not judged... You know, at any other judgment, I believe the Old Testament saints, specifically, I guess you could say the prophets, if you want to get real technical, but the prophets are judged at the great white throne judgment. I think that's very clear from Revelation 11. Also, people say, how many ever heard this phrase? People will say this, I love Brother Sammy Allen, he's in heaven. I love Brother Allen to death. Uh, But he used to always say... um, The saved go to the judgment seat and the lost go to the great white throne. And I heard that from more than just Brother Allen, but I remember him saying it all the time. Saved go to the judgment seat of Christ, the lost go to the great white throne judgment. I mean, y'all heard that before in your life. I mean, I've heard it over and over and over. I said that so much, but here's what you got to understand. At the great white throne judgment, there's going to be more than just lost people there. There's going to be quote unquote saved people or should I say this let me get a little bit more specific the millennial kingdom saints got to be judged if there are there going to be people during the millennial kingdom they're going to follow Christ so when are they going to be judged at the great white throne judgment so there's going to be more than just lost people at the great white throne judgment there's going to be saved people there quote unquote and we're going to be in the grand sands of heaven. And guess what we're going to be doing? People say we're going to be we're going to be looking back and just looking upon the scene when God judges the world. No, 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 no. We're not going to be just standing back. What does the Bible say that we're going to do? We're going to be judging angels. Amen. And there's another place I forget off the top of my head, brother Darren. Maybe you can help me with this. There's another place that says we're going to judge the world too. Is it, or am I making that up in my brain? Okay, I know for a fact 1 Corinthians 6 talks about us judging angels. That's 1 Corinthians 6 2. 6 2? Peter about us judging the world. Okay, all right, there you go. I didn't think I was making it up, but sometimes I do that. All right, so notice we're going to be judging at the great white throne judgment. We are going to be taking part in the great white throne judgment. It's just part of it. All right, so notice small and great. And notice this last phrase. I think this is so interesting. And should us destroy them which destroy the what? The earth. Now, I am not an environmentalist. Okay, I don't believe that the greenhouse gases that we're emitting are causing the earth temperatures to rise and global warming and all. I mean, in the 70s, it was all this, the, the ice ages come. There's going to be an ice age, an ice age, an ice age. Then they figured out that that wasn't scaring people. So then they said, oh, uh, global warming's happening. Global warming, the earth is getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And guess what? The earth, they found out. Now, have you noticed? Have you ever noticed now that they don't call it global warming anymore? What do they call it? Climate change. Climate change. Because they figured out that, you know what, the earth really isn't warming. And there are some places that it's not warming. The polar ice caps are still here. Al Gore, you know, remember he came out with that, uh, what what was it called, inconvenient truth. And he said, you know, the polar ice caps are going to be gone in 12 years. And and it just hasn't happened. Things, Things have not changed. All that kind of stuff. And so now they're not calling it global warming. They're just calling it climate change. Well, we're having such severe weather these days because of global warming. And we're having, and I could get into all sorts of conspiracy theories on why we're having more severe weather, I think. Uh, but listen, there's always been periods of more severe weather. I mean, anybody with one eye and half a brain knows this. Boy, we had a real mild winter this year. Or man, this winter's been really bad, right? So I'm not an environmentalist. But I do think it's interesting that God says he's going to destroy them which destroy the what? The earth. If you notice, that's a direct cross-reference back to where? Does anybody remember? Genesis 6. That was one of the reasons that God destroyed the world with the flood was because they were corrupting the earth. Now, how does that happen? I've talked about this before. It's been a while back, though. One of the ways, we won't get into all the Scripture this morning, uh, and I don't have them all written down anyway, but if you notice in the, uh, in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the law, when they would go into the land, God would say, now make sure you don't shed innocent blood in the land and defile the land or the corrupt the land. Remember, God told him in, in Deuteronomy 28 through 
30, he says that if you don't follow my law and you commit fornication and commit all the abominations of the land of, of the people that were here before, that the land will literally do what? Spit you out. The land will 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 will, will spit you out. It'll push you. So there's something there connected with the sins of mankind that literally defile the earth. God talks about cleansing the land. That's not just all about the people. Have you ever wondered about the, 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 the offerings? Where, did, where were the offerings of blood poured out on? The altar, the altar but, but not all of them were poured on the altar. Where, where was the blood poured out upon? The ground. The drink offerings, where were they poured on? The ground. So there's some connection there between the sins of man and the land. Now, this is some speculation. This is purely speculative. Uh, you could go down a rabbit hole with this. So this is not theology. Maybe somebody could develop it further. This is just a little bit of theory that I have. But what are you made out of? Dirt. Dust. You're made out of the ground. I mean, you, if you were to break it down, you could find minerals and stuff inside of you. That's why, listen, mineral water, they say it's good for you. That's stuff that comes straight from the ground. You know why? Because that's what you're made of. How many ever noticed, and I know some of you are weirdos, you don't like going around barefoot. I love going around barefoot. All right? You get out there and you sink your toes down in the mud and dirt or the sand. I mean, I love just going out and putting my toes right in the sand at the beach. I mean, I love it. Going out there, walking around barefoot in the grass and all that. You know why a lot of kids, I mean, have you ever noticed how kids just love to roll around in the dirt? You know why? Because that's what they're made of. The New Agers have this thing called grounding where they say you're supposed to connect to the earth by, by walking barefoot and grounding yourself and all that. And, and listen, that's that, a lot of that New Agey stuff, you gotta, it, it's paganism and mysticism. But I'm going to give you a little bit of theory here. Just This is theory, I, nothing solid. I don't even know if I believe this. I'm just throwing it out. But it could be the reason why the earth is corrupted by the things that we do is because we are made from the earth and there is some kind of connection there. What, what does the Bible say? When we die, we return to what? Dust. To the dust. We return to the earth. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So there could be some kind of connection there that when we physically sin, we are doing something to the earth that God does not like. And obviously he doesn't like it because he destroyed uh, the earth at one point because of it and he's going to do it again right so anyway all right well we'll uh, in verse number 19 let's look at verse number 19 and we'll get out of here and we'll pick up next now next week it's going to be weird man in, in chapter 12 we're going to look at some weird stuff about the man child look at revelation eleven nineteen. 19 and the temple of god was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail now a lot of people, and, and boy, we could go into a month-long study on the Ark of the Covenant, but a lot of people gather from verse number 19 that the Ark of the Covenant is no longer here on earth. They say, well, the Ark of the Covenant is seen in heaven. John sees it in heaven. I've, I've heard people say, oh, I know exactly where the Ark is. Ain't nobody even got to look for it no more. It's there in heaven. Because the Bible says that heaven opened up, the temple of God was shown, and John saw the Ark of the, Tem uh, Ark of the Covenant right there in heaven. All right, there's one fatal flaw with that line of reasoning. You know what it is? Anybody know? John seeing, seeing yeah, that's true. John seeing, seeing a future event, so it could be taken up sometime during the tribulation period or something like that. That's one possibility, absolutely. But there's another really just fatal flaw with that reasoning, thinking that because he saw the Ark of the Covenant in heaven that it has to be there in heaven. Anybody know? Here it is. Remember Hebrews chapter number 8? Hebrews chapter number 8 says that Moses received the quote-unquote blueprints for the tabernacle and all the instruments in the tabernacle from what? From the pattern that was shown him of the instruments in the heavens. So there is, for everything that was in the earthly tabernacle, there is also heavenly instruments in heaven, the heavenly tabernacle. So there is an Ark of the Covenant in heaven. There is an uh, uh, altar of incense. There is a table of shepherd. All those things, it's the pat these are the earthly patterns 
of the heavenly pattern. You can read that in Hebrews chapter number 8. So just because John saw the Ark of the Covenant in heaven does not mean that it is the actual Ark of the Covenant that was on the earth. I think the Ark of the Covenant is on the earth, and I think the Jews know exactly where it's at. So, but that's another story for another time. Amen? All right, any questions, comments, or concerns? All right, let's pray. We'll get out of here. Father, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, thank you for your book. I love studying your book. I love teaching your book. Lord, I pray that you'd help us now as we go into the 11 o'clock hour. Lord, everything go according to your will and way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you are dismissed.